Welcome to Jewish Boy Calls His Mother. I'm your host, Sadia, and this is my mother, Ima. Hey, Ima. Hey, another opportunity to make a fool of myself. Go ahead. No worries. You're doing great. Um, yeah. One of the things I wanted to talk about. Yeah. Raven um, says hello. Oh, yes, Raven. Oh, hello, yes. Raven. You're just so cute. Um, we talked about this like in an early episode, like episode one or two. About okay, we talk about Pesach cleaning. Let's talk about Pesach cleaning. <laughs> okay. I, I really want to talk about this. Can we can we please just follow my directions? It can be fun. Following directions Direction. can be fun. I, I, I can made be up that fun. song. I got a copyright. Can be fun. Right. Following directions can be fun. For you and, and me, me and, and everyone. everyone. Mm -hmm. yes. Fantastic. Um, the audience doesn't know that that was a song I made up for you children when you wouldn't follow my directions. I would start singing that song and singing it and singing it and singing it and not stop until the directions were followed. Yes, redundancy and annoyance has been such an accomplishment for you. Like the Chinese uh, water torture. Yes, it was exactly like Chinese water torture. <laughs> um, we could talk about Pesach cleaning and then we can move on to my topic, hopefully, please. Um, actually, I do have a question about Pesach drink. cleaning, Ima. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of Pesach cleaning did you guys do when you were a kid? Did did you do anything or was the concept was so foreign to you? It was very foreign. It was, um, well, my mother cleaned the kitchen. My mother, you know, cleaned out all the cabinets in the kitchen and she changed the dishes. Okay. And, um, but she, you know, she wiped down the counters, but she, um, um, she didn't kosher the counter mm -hmm. and she didn't put out like pads or anything over the counters she just wiped them down very well she's cleaned them very well she could clean the kitchen very well for pace i remember and i remember as a kid the morning um where you have to finish eating comets by 10 or 11 o'clock i remember her like giving me cereal in the morning and telling me hurry up and eat it and you have to eat it before 10 o'clock interesting interesting and what were the satyrs like when i was a kid we used to have the sedurim with the whole family at my um at my aunt's house with my grandfather and my bubby and my aunts and uncles uh, my aunt my aunt, yeah my aunts and my uncles and my my now my father's family my father said my mother said her parents made a seder my father said that his father tried one time to make a seder and that he and his brother being boys, being little boys, were fooling around. And his father, after that, never made a Seder again. But um, when my, I remember when I was little, my grandfather was alive. I remember us, you know, getting together for, for Sedurim. Oh, what happened to us? Oh, sorry. And um, then after my grandfather uh, passed away, um, later on, for some reason, we I remember when we moved out to the suburbs. I don't know what it was. It was like we stopped getting together for the Sudurim and we just had our own Seder with our own immediate family with my father and my mother and my and my sisters and I. We just had our own little family Seder. Yeah, I think I remember us having this conversation previously. I was just yeah. curious about it. That's yes, right. Yeah. We yeah, had, we, had, we, we talked we talked I yeah. yeah, I mean, because I'm I'm thinking more of like, I guess when you start learning about the Orthodox version of how to do things, what was your initial reaction and, and where'd you take it from there? Um, that I had to clean my drawers, I'd clean my room. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. <laughs> but um yeah. Now actually like I I don't um I don't I think a lot of it, well, I remember, oh boy, I remember when I first became from going my sugar crazy, you know, with um cleaning and um I remember my first Pesach in Crown Heights my um roommate and I well we had we had a basement apartment and so the night to the uh the night of Badika's the, the day before Badika's Hametz we were cleaning our apartment cleaning everything up and down and we had a problem in our apartment with, oh, that's right, that say, that, that Pesach, she was going back to her family in Ohio 
and I was going to spend Pesach in the dormitory at Machan Chana. And so, but we still cleaned the apartment, did Batikas Hamas in the apartment. So we had a roach problem and we didn't know where they were coming from. All we knew was in the morning, our apartment was freezing cold, by the way. It was a basement apartment. So in the wintertime, we would do is we would get out of bed and we'd run to the kitchen and turn on all the put on all the flames in the stove, on the stove. And as soon as we turned on all the flames, we would see these roaches running all over the place and getting burned. Yeah. Oh gosh. And then, New York apartment, eh? Oh, and then God. from there, we would run into the bathroom. We would turn on the hot water in the shower to steam up the bathroom. So we could at least get warm, get dressed in the bathroom where it was warm. I'm just thinking of like, I'm thinking of like the setting is like a, the 1970s New York City, Brooklyn, Crown Heights, you know, some dingy apartment with like cockroaches and everything. And like, you just became like from, so it's a whole like experience of like isolation from your family on some level. And you're like just struggling to get by and struggling to like, you know, cope with everything. I mean, you know, the thing is, I... It was it was it was it was worth the uh, it was it was worth the how can I say it um when you it changed when you exchange something for something else yeah it was worth the, it was worth the uh, what's it called it was worth the exchange I think it's I think that's what it is yeah. that, um you know true I could have led a much more comfortable life in my parents suburban house in you know in Baltimore but <clears throat> in the suburbs of Baltimore in their nice lit level comfortable house mm -hmm. but. I wanted to have a different life experience. I wanted to be from, I wanted to be in a from community. I also wanted to have my own place. I thought I graduated college and I'd worked for a year and um had my own car and now it was time to to move on and to have my own uh yeah, my own uh, apartment as as dingy. <laughs> dingy and as uncomfortable as it was. Oh, so gosh. anyway, so that pace like we're cleaning the stove and the these roaches we realized they're coming from our stove. We opened up the stove. We found the nest. Oh. And we grab the fantastic cleaner. We start spritzing. <laughs> and the roaches are running. And we're spritzing them with the fantastic cleaner. And we're mimicking the roaches. We're going, Help. I can't hear you. Say it one more time. It, it, Ima, Ima, wait, wait, wait. Your yeah. your audio, your audio uh blocked, got blocked. You're fine. Oh. You're fine. It just happens sometimes. Okay. Um, on Zoom. Say that one can more time, please. Now? I can hear you so now. We, so we start joking around, pretending like the roaches are talking, and we put on these voices and go, We have to put in your house. She doesn't. She recognizes. We have to put in your house. And we're chasing <laughs> the roaches with the fantastic. Oh, That's awesome. And they're running all over the place. So we cleaned up the whole. I mean, we cleaned that stove. Boy, did we clean that stove. Mm hmm. And so we told our landlady uh, about it, that we've actually found, you know, the nest and everything. So she goes, you know what? While you girls are out, I'm going to set an insect bomb, like one of those foggers. She yeah. said, I'm going to, since you guys are not in the apartment, everything's cleaned out. I'm going to, you know, I'll set a fogger. And that's what she did. She set a fogger and that took care of it. Nice. Took care of the entire roach program, problem, program, problem. Yeah, it was a program. It was a program. You had a, um, so I guess eventually you kind of got the bigger, better hang of like Pesach and Pesach cleaning and what to do, what not to do, not to overwhelm yourself. Yeah. Um, I remember and... then when I was in the following, the next year after that, when I was in the dormitory, I mean, I was working, I was working and I was attending classes and this school where I worked would, would only, wouldn't give us off until the day of Badika's comments. Mm. And the teachers were not happy about it, but they, that's what they did. That's what their policy was. So I find myself um, the night before Badika's Hametz cleaning my room from top to bottom, my closet and everything. So what do I do? I put on um, I put on um, the, you know, the classical station that they have in New York and they're playing a French, it's a French opera company doing Carm, doing Bizet's Carmen. Explain that, please. And what? Explain that, please. Bizet Carmen. Oh, uh, George Bizet, the okay. famous opera from like from the eighteen forties, his most famous opera, Carmen, okay. the one where you get all these um, very very like my one of my professors in college used to call it a hit tune. 
opera, like, too. you know, like, um, a lot of, you have a lot of arias that eventually became very popularized and became, um, like, how can I say it? Like, very well known. Cliché. Yeah, and we're used in commercials and also. So it became cliché like because it was so popular. Yeah. So this was a French company that did it. Wow. I mean, I had heard recordings of Bizet's Carmen before by the Metropolitan Opera and all sorts of different opera companies. But a French company doing this, they knew how to put the real feeling into the opera. I mean, the when the woman who took the role of Carmen sang Habanera, mm -hmm. she made you, she put a slant on that aria aria that Carmen was not just a bad girl. Carmen was dealing with serious depression. So could you explain this to me, please? Because I'm, I'm as a layman, I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. So okay, here's how the opera goes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It takes place where um there's this there's Don Cosse. Don Cosse committed a crime in his little it takes place in Spain. And he committed a crime where he um, stole from the poor box. And so he is totally ostracized. And he's, you know, he's totally ostracized. His parents don't want to have anything to do with him. His you know, mother, you know, doesn't want anything to do with him. And he joins a military unit called the Dragoons. Mm -hmm. The Dragoons dressed in very bright orangey red um, uniforms, which made them very good targets. <laughs> so anyway, his little town sweetheart, Mikhail, goes to where the um, unit is, where the with where he's serving, and she is looking for him. And so she comes up to the guardhouse, and she says that she's looking for um, this soldier named Jose from this particular town. And the she's a very pretty young girl. And the soldiers say, well, we don't know where he is, but if you want to wait, you can wait with us in the guardhouse. And uh, he turns them down. Uh, no, thank you, for obvious reasons. Anyway, she finally gets um, to Don Jose. And she tells him that, you know, come back home, your mother forgives you. And she gives him a letter from his parents, from his mother, and he reads the letter, and he's very, of course, touched by it. Now, in the same town, there's a cigarette factory, and working in the cigarette factory are these uh, girls that are not of the best reputation, and the most beautiful of them is Carmen. And all the men just want Carmen. So Carmen comes out from the cigarette factory at the end of her shift with the other girls smoking cigarettes, which was very unladylike in those days. And these men run over to her and they go, Carmen, when will you love us? When will you love us? And she says, oh, I don't know, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, I don't know. And then she sings that very famous song. Oh, Ima, Ima. Yeah? For, for some reason, when you hit high notes, the yeah. audio um, doesn't pick it up. Okay, so I'll sing lower. That, 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 you've heard that one. Yes. Okay, yes, it's called I Habanera. Have. And she sings that very famous Habanera. Don Jose, uh, what happens is she gets into a fight with another girl at the factory. And it's a real horrible drag out fight and she takes out a knife and she slashes the other woman across the face Ooh. and so she gets arrested by the soldiers Don, she's handcuffed they put her in a chair and they're waiting for the police to come take her away to jail and Don Jose is given the job of guarding her so he bangs her it's a French it's French right yeah so she so she starts to tell him about this nice little cantina 
that she goes to um da, 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 Lily Pastures, Lily Pastures Cantina. Mm -hmm. And how nice it is. Wouldn't it be nice if the two of them went there together? And that goes. <laughs> so anyway, um, she convinces him to let her go. Mm. He has to go by the oh, by the Carmen's a gypsy. Oh, okay. So that's why they're supposed to in in France, similar to the Notre Dame story. The hunchback yeah. of Notre Dame. Yeah. So Carmen's a gypsy. Anyway, so Don Jose unties her, un uncuffs her, and he lets her go. And his commanding officer comes over and starts arguing with him about what you know, she's she's a prisoner, you know, look what she did. Why are you letting her go? And Don Jose and the commanding officer get into a real big fight, and Don Jose slugs his commanding officer. Whoa. So he's in big trouble. And Carmen convinces him to run away with her to the mountains, to the gypsy camp. Mm -hmm. So he does that. He runs away with her to the gypsy camp. And then at the gypsy camp, the gypsy, her gypsy friends are dealing tarot cards. They're telling you, they're telling four oh, tarot, tarot cards, tarot, tarot cards. Tarot cards, okay. Carmen pulls out the ace of spades. That means death, right? Right. And she pulls it out again. And again, and you hear this theme, da, 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 boom, boom, da, 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 boom, boom. <laughs> Whenever they, you hear that theme, you know, it's like her death theme, you know, Carmen's going to get, she's going to get, anyway, so she decides that if she's going to die, she's going to live life to the fullest, and oh yeah, I forgot, there's another character in the opera, the Toreador. The Toreador, she falls in love with Carmen. And so Carmen decides to dump Don Jose for the, wow, for the Toreador. It, it, what's, what's with the Toreador? Is that just his name or? No, the Toreador, it's the bullfighter. Oh, I thought so. It sounded yeah. like that. But wait, so it, is the this? Theme, the Toreador theme where they fall in love, he comes out with his entourage and all this glory and, and trust in his, it's called the Tra Traje de luces, it means the suit of, the suit of light. Mm -hmm. That's what the the um, the costume that they wear when they fight the bulls, that's what it's called in Spanish. The traje de luces. So anyway, so he his his famous song that you've probably seen in a lot of commercials is da 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 he falls in with her, and she decides she's going to dump this this little small town guy, Don Jose, who doesn't have much money, and is in a lot of trouble with his command with the with the dragoons now, with the commanding officer. She mm -hmm. dumps, so she decides that she's going to go with the Toreador. Michael is trying to convince Don Jose. She finds him, and she goes up to the mountains, and she finds him, and she tries to convince him to please come back home with her to their hometown. Mm -hmm. You know. But he won't do it. He's still in love with Carmen. So anyway, Carmen runs off with the Toreador. At the towards at the end of the opera, finally, it's the time for the big bullfight, and Carmen comes in on the arms of her Toreador, and he goes to fight. He goes to the bullfight, and she's um like alone waiting for the bullfight to be over when who shows up? Don Jose, and he is crazy in love with her, and he wants her to come away with him. She says, no, it's over between us. He says, I gave up so much for you. Says, I, you know, I hit my commanding officer. I let you loose. I did, I did so much for you and just dumping me. She says, you know, yeah, she's, a, she's going with the Toreador. You know, he's, he's got money. He's got power. He's got position. She's going with the Toreador. So Don Jose pulls the knife and he says, you know, he pulls, he pulls the knife. He says, Carmen, I'm warning you. You know, you either come with me or else. And then you hear the da, 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 boom, boom. And so she says, well, if you're going to kill me, go ahead and get it over with. You know, she really yeah. challenges him. So he stabs her to death. And just as she falls dead, the Toreador and all the people are coming out of the bull ring and they're cheering because the Toreador has killed the bull and they come out and Don Jose is 
is bent over the body of Carmen. It's obvious he's got the knife in his hands. He's just killed her. And the police come and they drag him away. And that's, and that's the end of the story. Yes. So you were cleaning pace off listening to this. Go on. <laughs> so uh, as you were cleaning, cleaning your, your dorm room during Pesach, listening to this opera, something happened. What happened? Nothing happened. My room got cleaned. Oh, okay. All right. You really stabbed the the the, uh, the chametz and really, you know, took it to town, I guess. I don't know. Um, so I wanted to talk about uh, something we talked about on a, pre- a previous podcast, but I think we never, like, we couldn't elaborate on, or I think it was just something that, you know, I wanted to discuss more. Um, I, 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 was speaking, you know I, mean? I was speaking with someone who was showing me their Facebook post and their comment. And somebody made a Facebook post about how it seemed like this person was saying they're conservative, but slightly modern orthodox, but they live in a reform community. And they want to know why or how can someone, you know, still stay from, so to speak, and still be involved in the from in the reform community and eat non-kosher. And the person I was speaking to, they made a comment saying, well, it's just because they, they're they trying to, you know, have their cake and eat it too. And in general, you know, it's just being a bagels and lox Jew without putting in all the effort of, of Torah and mitzvahs. And then <laughs> someone got offended by her using the term bagels and lox. And for me, it's more of like, there could have been a softer approach. There could have been a softer approach to it, but there is this feeling and I, I noticed it also on an Instagram post that I just saw today about someone complaining about the uh, kosher style and how misleading that really is and yes, mm-hmm. yes. and it's just it's very oh hey Raven uh, it's very frustrating but it's just like people get offended by that because they feel like you know now you're be calling them you know not Jewish enough, and they feel like that's something that you know they take offense to, but in reality is that you know everyone's always going to struggle with from kite. Everyone's always going to struggle with with keeping the laws, but just don't lie to yourself and tell yourself it's fine when you know you're 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 breaking halacha. You know what I mean? Or what I what I've noticed on the other hand was that people get so engrossed in finding loopholes and finding ways to twist and turn you know, a halacha that they get lost in this ether of going against halacha without really thinking they're going against halacha. Like, you know, some people think chewing non-kosher gum is okay because you're technically not eating it. You know, it's not, you're, you're spitting it out. It doesn't need a bracha. If it doesn't need a bracha, then it, because you're only chewing it, then, then technically it doesn't matter what, what you put in your mouth as long as you're spitting it all out. But it's just like, obviously, you can't consume the juices. You're getting a benefit from the juices. And the juices themselves can be from the non-kosher gum is taken. You know, you're getting benefit and you're you're ingesting non, uh, non-kosher, you know, saliva, so to speak. But people have, like, twisted in a way where they kind of, you know, think it's okay when really if they stopped and gave it some thought, they'd realize that it's actually not. And I want to go through the understanding of like being a bagels and locks Jew and going through those feelings and motions <clears throat> and really understanding that like, you know, what is Jewish identity? <clears throat> well, as you know, in Chabad, what we call a non-religious Jew, we call them a customer. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> the, the, okay, we feel this... Um, Having been there, done that, um, there, my problem, I remember, you know, I had a very strong Jewish identity. The fact that, first of all, the fact that a person has a, a strong, is, a Jew, if a Jewish person has a strong Jewish identity, that, that speaks volumes. That's terrific. And I think they should take it from, the, if they take it from there and start going to Shi'orim, particularly um, you know, Shurim that are you know, sponsored. We have a lot, they have a lot of outreach groups now, not just Chabad, a lot of outreach groups are out there. And start studying the laws of Kashrus, laws of Shabbos, and this and that. And, you know, going to from families on Shabbos, being exposed to that experience. Um, I think eventually these people 
we'll start taking on more halakha. Now, my problem was the way I was raised. I was raised that all these things like Shabbos and Kashuras, that they weren't real Jewish laws. They were just, quote unquote, traditions. Yeah. And right. customs. I didn't realize the severity of what they really were until I started to actually learn. So I started to go to Shiurim and actually learn about these things. And to my shock, found out this is real Jewish law. To my goodness, had I known that this was real Jewish law, I would have kept Shabbos and Kashrus a long time ago. Yeah, it's... And a, lot, and a lot of people have that erroneous, you know, have that erroneous um, uh, opinion. But it's not, you know, it's not their fault. It's not that they're actually, you know, it's not, it's not really their fault. For a lot of these people, they they weren't raised with a good Jewish education. And also, I, and then this business about quote-unquote kosher style. Um, there are many states now where they cannot use that term anymore. Interesting. Um, they there are many states where if that they can say Jewish style or Jewish European style or something like that, but they cannot say kosher style anymore. Um, one of the problems I had, and I became from was that you had these some of these restaurants, um, like Suburban House. Anyone from Baltimore will remember Suburban House, and they tried to pass themselves off as being, like you said, kosher style. And they even had shiva platters. And when I became from and I tried to explain to my family, hey, this really isn't kosher. They thought that I was Meshuga from. You know, you know, yeah, I mean, I had this conversation with Ruthie and she literally had that like exact thought process of like, because it's this whole thing of, you know, Anyone that observes less than you is totally fry. Anybody who observes more than you is totally crazy. <laughs> you know, it's that it's that feeling like you're like mm -hmm. like like it's similar to with driving on the highway. Anyone going faster than you is a maniac. Anyone slower than you is a moron. <laughs> it's it's that that feeling and vibe like oh, you know, like I'm center. I'm in the middle. You know, everyone mm -hmm. else is just you know haven't found themselves yet. I think that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Um. But this person that they said that um, about living in the community and you know how, uh, reconciling it, it it sounds to me this person really has an inner desire to want to learn and to want to be involved in Judaism, and that that's really terrific. That's that's a one that's a one you know this this person doesn't want to run away from Judaism. This person identifies with being Jewish, is proud of being Jewish, and sounds to me like they really want to to be more involved, but maybe don't know where to go or where to start. I, and I think I think you're right. And I think what happens a lot of times is, you know, and I'm seeing it more and more now after October 7th, whereas that Jewish identity is now having to be challenged again of trying to figure out, well, what is Jewish identity? Um, and from what I've noticed, I think the the reform and conservative movement is have are they're having and I think I said this before, is that they're having this this conflict because they've been so Zionist for such a long time. And now the trendy thing to do is being anti-Zionist. And unfortunately, in the reform and conservative circles, like it's in their mantra, so to speak, of that, like, they have to stick with the times and bend halakha with the mm -hmm. times instead of the opposite. Well, and, I, I was... I'm going to say, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, and, 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 and what's been happening is that, like, they've been having this conflict of, do we still stay Zionist or do we become an anti-Zionist? Mm -hmm. And that's really the make it or break it because, you know, our whole religion, our whole culture, everything revolves around Israel. You know, the last thing we say at a Pesach Seder is, you know, next year in Jerusalem, you know, where and that's something that we have to, to bear in mind. And I think it's something that, you know, is important, um, but it's up to them and, and what they plan on doing. And I think a lot of them are doing the right thing where they're just sticking with their guns and saying, no, we are going to support Israel. We're going to support the Jewish state. Um, but you were going to say something? Well, I was, um, was at a uh, talk that was given by a Lubavitcher Shliach. And one of the people at the, you know, 
Q&A asked about, um, he asked, uh, you know, like why, why it, I think the question was why, um, as an Orthodox Jew, he was so against the conservative and reform movement. Of course, the person, this was a Q&A for a crowd that was mixed of mm -hmm. religious, non-religious, but, you know, and he said he's not, a, he says he's not against the conservative and reform movement. He says, but what he objects to is they present themselves as the totality of Judaism. And that's what throws people off. He says, if they were to present themselves as, well, you know, we're, we're on a ladder, okay? If you want to have a Jewish association, but you don't want to keep shops or kosheras, you know, we're here for you. But there are other options. But if you want this op, if you choose this option, we're here for you. Or the conservative movement too. Like conser conservative is interesting. Conservative, you have people keeping kosher, not keeping kosher. Just like the conservative, you have reform of people, you know, who are not keeping kosher or, or anything yet, you know, or Shabbos. And then you have your kosher orthodox keeping kosher and Shabbos. And then you have like the conservative, like people kind of, you know, the, the people that don't feel that they fit in either in either in either slot. But he had a point there, you know, that that you know that they that's what he objects to that they are presenting themselves as the totality of Judaism you know and when you try to talk to a lot of people you know, like when I've, I've been on whenever I've like you know passed out Shabbos scandals or Jewish information and I run into people who refuse the shop no I don't like Shabbos scandals I'm reform and I try to explain to them look Judaism is Judaism lighting Shabbos candles is a myth of a Jewish of a Jewish woman you know, why, you know, why say you're not going to do it just because you've labeled yourself as a reformed Jew? I said, you can be a reformed Jew and light Shabbos candles. You can be a reformed Jew and keep kashas. You can be a reformed Jew and keep Taras Mishpacha. If you're going to a reformed temple is the type of temple you want to go to, a type of, you know, you know, that's, that's your business. That's your right as an American. It's your religious expression. But don't shut yourself off from, you know, from Judaism by saying, oh, well, I'm reformed. I don't do that. And what they didn't understand is they don't understand. Um, they think that Jewish law, there are people that think that Jewish law only applies to those who are Orthodox. That if you're Reformed or Conservative, Jewish law doesn't apply to you. And of course, that's not true. Jewish law applies to everybody. And 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 that's that's where the conflict begins, where it's like, People feel like they don't want to be told what to do. They feel like there's this whole, you know, corrupt conflict with the rabbis. They think it's a whole, you know, it's a whole fraudulent system, you know, and it's it it, it's, it goes down this whole rabbit hole of what of what really defines Yiddishkeit. And I think what's happening is that you know Moshe Emes Visarasa Emes. So the truth will always be there. And I think every type of sheker that comes by, it just slowly chips away and you eventually come back to MS. Like, if I'm not mistaken, I think the reform movement came first and the reform movement was a reflection of the Enlightenment movement in Europe, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. The Ascala movement. The reform movement was right. the Ascala movement mm -hmm. at the time. Right. And the Ascala movement back in the day were real POSs where, like, they could... They would get Jews thrown into jail. They can get Jews killed because they're trying to be like the Gaim and they do whatever they could. And now, and like I remember when you telling me that like Reform Judaism, they refused to wear yarmulkes in the 50s and 60s. And now Reform Jews wear yarmulkes. Now Reform Jews mm -hmm. talk about, you know, the Shabbos and whatnot. And it's there's mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of change. And what happens is, is that like, you know, the reform movement of today versus the Ascala movement of the 1700s, it's yeah. almost polar opposites. Right. And you know? So it's just like yeah. all this shekher that comes out, like I'm not scared. Of, I'm not scared for it because I know it's just going to be like yeah. MS is going to beat it down and it's just going to be the MS that's going to be revealed. And that's it. You well, um, there, there were many years ago um, in Baltimore that I had big bags of Shabbos candles that I was mm -hmm. passing out. And uh, Baltimore Hebrew had just opened up their their school, and so I thought, yeah, I'm going to go in there and talk to the principal and offer her shop the shop of candles. And she says to me, "I'm so happy you came here." She says, "We're just starting our unit on the Shabbat 
And this was perfect. She goes, how many camels can you give me? I said, how many do you need? She goes, she needs 24. I said, great, I'll get them for you. And I brought her a big bag of 24 Shabbos candles with the, with the, you know, the calendars, the brochures, everything. And she thanked me so much. She said, this is great. They're going to pass them out to the class. This, this would be perfect for their unit on Shabbos. Yeah. And I, I, forgot, I forgot it. Right. Shabbat. Yeah, they, they call it Shabbat. It, it, they give it more of a Sephardi uh, t- tinge to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's what, what, I, what I find so fascinating and so positive is that, you know, Jewish identity is, is just going strong. You know, there's a, a lot of people that they're like putting on tefillin and wearing yarmulke and tzitzis is just the norm now. You know, whatever you hold is whatever you hold, but you put on tefillin, you wear yarmulke, you wear tzitzis. Yeah, you were talking to me before you mentioned before about some of the, you know, some of the sad things that go on, you know, among, from Jews that should not go on. And there was this friend of mine who was a Gioris. Mm-hmm. And she said that, she when she comes across things like this, like we all do, rabbis that don't conduct themselves as rabbis should, yeah. you know, from people who you think for from person that person you know should have done better or should have could have behaved better. Yeah. And she yeah. says she reminds herself of of she reminds herself of a saying, don't judge the religion by the people who follow it. Judge the religion for itself. Well, and, also- she said that, and she said that keeps her faith going, you know, as as a as a converted Jew, as someone who's a Gears, she says that keeps her that that keeps her like steady. Yeah, and I think that's what also happens when it comes to Judaism. Where I know this happens more in New York City and maybe in other some parts of Baltimore, where it's like there's a lot of judgment, a lot of um, a lot of invasive uh, attitudes that come about. Um, you know, the the a lot of people would have this fear of getting a shidduch because they wore jeans, you know, and it sounds silly, but it's like there's a major judgment in the from community that they have to really calm down on. And I think that's where, like, in my opinion, Chabad kind of helps shift gears or at least mm-hmm. helps you know, tame these, these judgments, because, you know, mm-hmm. now, nowadays saying that you're Chabad doesn't necessarily mean that you're Haredi or anything like that. It just means you go to a Chabad house. But, you know, that being said, it just means that everybody mm-hmm. feels comfortable at Chabad, that you could mm-hmm. have the most religious person and the most non-religious person be there in the same minion because it's like, it's Chabad. So it's more of like, they accept mm-hmm. everybody. It's okay. You know, you, know, you mentioned something about I remember, um, yeah, I remember when I came from and I was, um, yeah, you know, I was going for shaduchim, and there were there were some women in the community. Oh, if you do this, no one's going to make want to make a shidduch with you. If you do that, no boy's going to want to date you, whatever. And I said, I said to these people, I go, look, whoever wants me, wants to marry me, will marry me for myself. And I, I said, I'm not, I, don't, I said, I'm not, I don't care. I'm not paying attention to any of this. And I think, um, yes, there is there is pressure, and I've I've spoken to people who um you know have fallen prey to this type of community pressure whatever and you know something it's up to the individual to get strong and to say listen i'm not falling for any of this if that person's family doesn't want me as a son-in-law or daughter-in-law because my family doesn't have money or does a position tough on them guess what it's a two-way street i don't want them either if a girl or a boy doesn't want me because I don't have Gedge, guess what? It's a two-way street. If Gedge is so important to them, let them marry somebody else. Please don't marry me. It's a yeah. two-way street. A basher is a basher. And God is the one who makes these shaduchim. And as, as a matter of fact, have you ever read Dating, Dating Navigator? Even we have 10 seconds left. Okay. Well, Dating Navigator, the Zadie, who's a social worker, he's good. He emphasize 